with bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us stand in open worship this morning with the singing of our opening hymn, All Glory, God, and all. offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So let us stand now before the throne of grace and freely confess our sins using the prayer of confession found in the bulletin. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and have turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ our Savior. Um, have you ever been fortunate enough to have that magic moment when the crowd goes wild for you? That clutch hit in baseball, making the winning touchdown, playing or singing a solo perfectly, bringing a crowd first to tears and then to its feet. It's a pretty spectacular feeling, coming to the culmination of a moment, a career, or even a lifetime. I don't know if there are any Red Sox fans in the room, but it was Gary Carter who was well known for never uttering an offensive word, who said with two outs in the bottom of the ninth of Game 6, I'm sorry Steve Winslow, but of the uh, bottom of the ninth of the 1986 World Series with the Mets facing a spectacular fail by losing the World Series after a spectacular season, I'm not making the last darn out of the World Series. And he didn't. He started a rally that turned around a game, a team, millions of fans, and eventually turned the series from one of bitter disappointment into unimaginable. Have you ever had one of those weeks? Boss or bosses after you, deadlines looming, twice as much work as ours? We're going forth, you have no idea how you're going to get through it. it happened, I happen to have one of those weeks just this week. 60 hours and still not everything accomplished. I spent some scarce time I had this week during my lunch at my desk on Monday, touring the ancient part of the old city of Jerusalem. What a truly amazing place. The ancient, narrow, winding roads, brick walls lining both sides of the narrow, dusty streets, nary a tree in sight. I literally have no idea how people found their way around. And that comes from someone who learned to drive in Brooklyn. I had the advantage of taking my, uh, my trip uh, with the click of a mouse on my computer, courtesy to the amazing uh, application known as uh, Google's Window or Google's Maps. I can go, with the click of a mouse, I can go anywhere around the world. All I can say is I'm glad when they passed my house, the lawn happened to be mowed and the garbage cans were put away. Not always the case, I'm afraid. But really, if you haven't, and you're able, and you can't make the pilgrimage physically, you can take, it, take a look at it electronically, at the streets that Jesus trod, the path he took that holy week so long ago, the places, the garden, the court, and the place of his eventual execution. I visited the place where the second temple, which became known as Herod's temple, once stood, now of course where the Muslim dome of the rock stands, in the center on a hill overlooking the countryside, invisible for miles around. What a sight it must have been for those pilgrims in Jesus' time, coming into the city and seeing the temple where God himself dwelt among his people. What an amazing place Jesus was coming to on this Palm Sunday knowing full well what his week held in store for him, the culmination of over three years of teaching and preaching and ministry to bring his disciples to Jerusalem, to the temple, for the culmination of his career. I wonder what was going through the mind of Jesus' disciples coming to the big city, seeing the city on the hill. What a moment that must have been for those humble fishermen. What kind of lives were they living where they could expect to be brought to the center of the known universe with their teacher, that he may teach and preach in the temple there, the center of all Judaism. What was going through their minds? Arriving at the Mount of Olives, maybe a quarter of a mile outside the city, in plain view of the temple, 
Jesus sends two of them off to bring back the colt. As it says in Luke, is foretold in Zechariah, as Kristen read earlier. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's interesting to note that in Luke 19, Jesus refers to him as the Lord, a direct proclamation of his divinity. They laid coats upon the colt and upon the road, along with palm branches, as Jesus rode into the city. In Mark 11, it is written, Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Here we have Jesus at the height of his popularity, his movement, as it were, the people of Jerusalem welcoming him, the Savior, the Son of David, the Son of God. Imagine it. Those narrow, dusty roads lined with admirers, all shouting with praises, all shouting and praising him, laying their coats and garments on the road to keep down the dust as a sign of honor to the Lord who rode in on that day, bringing branches with them from possibly quite a distance and laying them on the road in front of him. It was a sign of homage and, and uh, submission as the people were looking to Jesus to be the promised Messiah, the great warrior who would overthrow the Romans and restore Israel's independence. Imagine the sight for a moment. This is the only time the Gospel tells us that Jesus rode an animal, walking throughout his entire ministry and then riding victoriously into ancient Jerusalem with the crowd shouting Hosanna, which means, say it now, as the people look to him as the great leader and Messiah. How full of pride the disciples must have felt for their leader whom they saw mocked, attacked, and plotted against throughout their ministry, how they must have felt they finally had their comeuppance, that all of the sacrifice and hardship they had faced throughout the ministry was finally paying off for them and, as, and for Jesus as well. And how were the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders looking upon Jesus? Who was this troublemaker coming in from the desert? Who was he to teach them about scriptures? I wonder how they were feeling as the crowds welcomed Jesus in like a king. What a sight indeed. What kind of week did the disciples think it was going to be? What kind of week did the chief priests think it was going to be? What kind of week did the Hosanna crowd think it was going to be, their Messiah sent from God, finally arriving? What kind of week did Herod and Pilate think it was going to be? And what kind of week did Jesus know it was going to be? What a difference a week can make. I ask you now, which crowd would you have been with? In John 10, 11, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, laying down his life for his sheep. And we are his sheep. I know we like to think of sheep as these cute little fluffy balls of wool who bop along without a care in the world, just eating grass and sunning themselves in the countryside, growing out their wool so we can keep warm in the wintertime, knitting a nice little cozy sweater out of them. But what are sheep really? Sheep are timid, stupid animals easily frightened and easily led astray. Some of you have heard me say this before, but it reminds me of the old Smothers Brothers routine where Dickie will call Tommy a dunderpate. Tommy will say, well, thank you, Dickie. Dickie shouts back, that's not a compliment. Well, I think we're really a bit in the same boat here, don't you? Because Jesus is to constantly guide us and act on our behalf as intercessor with God, the Father, because we're too stupid, we're corrupt, we're stubborn, and just too far gone reconcile. And here again, during this week in Jerusalem, we show our true stripes again. For in four short days, by Thursday of this week, one of Jesus' own disciples, one of the twelve who had been with him throughout his entire ministry, who probably felt much like the Hosanna crowd, cheering on the great military leader, the Messiah who would free them from Roman domination, betrays Christ to the authorities. And the following day, the rest of the crowd goes, shouting Hosanna, goes from shouting Hosanna to call, crying for his crucifixion before Pilate. Sheep led astray at the hands of wolves. So they rode into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. We come across one of my favorite lines of scripture in Luke 19 that reads, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. 
I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And when Jesus saw the city, he wept over it. He knew both his and Jerusalem's fate that week. And again, in Luke 19, verses 42 through 44, Jesus states, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Very prophetic. Today, the temple is gone, destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD during the Jewish revolt. Small remnants of the Temple Mount remain, and the Muslim Holy Dome of the Rock sits atop what was once the most holy site in all Judaism. Interestingly, the Muslim religion doesn't believe that Jesus ever suffered and died on the cross. That would be too undignified a death for a prophet of God. But Jesus is God, one part of the triune God who, as is stated in the Apostles' Creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, very real, very human, suffered a very undignified death. And as the Apostle Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 15, But if it is preached that Christ had been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for whom we have testified about God, that he raised Christ from the dead. And he died that undignified death for you and for me. So the crowd is there cheering on Jesus. The pilgrims who made the journey to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, who had heard of Jesus and the miracles he had performed, believing that he may be the Messiah the prophets had spoken about. You have the long-term residents of Jerusalem who may have turned out for curiosity's sake or perhaps the same reason as the pilgrims. The Pharisees are there for a very different reason, watching very closely every move this Jesus made such that they may carry out their plot against him. Still, in their theological infancy, the disciples didn't realize that they were fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah that they were placing Zion's new king upon that cult for his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. In John 12, 23, Jesus predicts his own death shortly after arriving in Jerusalem, fully preparing the disciples for life after his physical departure from this earth. And it's not until after Jesus returns and the disciples are given free grace and the spirit that they begin to understand the full extent of what's occurred in front of their eyes. Then they begin to reflect upon the follies and weaknesses of their first discipleship. As they begin to grow in their faith and understanding, much as, we, much as we grow in our faith journey. This is why they have compassion on those who are just beginning, who are ignorant in, truth, in, ignorant in true faith and belief, as should we be, constantly learning, constantly reading the Bible, and constantly teaching those who require learning. As Paul states again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, as, uh, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Backing up a bit, let's look at how we got here to Jerusalem. Along the way, outside Jericho, Jesus heals a blind beggar. The beggar here in the crowd asks who is passing by. The people tell him, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is passing by. He calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now this is important to note, since the Jewish tradition, the son of David, as exemplified by Solomon, was seen as full of wisdom, and as such, had the power to overcome Satan. The beggar is rebuked and told to be quiet, and mind his manners, and leave poor Jesus alone. But he shouted all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus hears what's going on and orders that the man be brought to him. When he comes near to Jesus, Jesus asks him what he wants him to do for him. Lord, I want to see, the beggar replies. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and, following, and followed Jesus, praising God. When the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus heals him and explains to the man that his faith 
and his persistence has healed him as our faith in Jesus heals our sins and allows us to see. Luke consistently shows us how Jesus cared for those in need, those who were rejected by society. Next, Jesus meets uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and these elements are again witnessed. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector and a wealthy man. Remember, tax collectors didn't get to be wealthy by doing a good job, receiving exemplary pay with stock options and bonuses tied to performance. No, they made their money by collecting more than what was due the state and skimming off their portion from the top. On top of that, they were extorting their taxes from fellow Jews to pay the occupying Romans. Tax collectors were not a welcome group. People didn't go out of their way to welcome them and bring them into their houses and throw them a nice banquet and barbecues. They were despised as wicked and corrupt. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was very good at being corrupt. Now I'm sure you're familiar with the story of Zacchaeus, a short character, and wanting to see Jesus, climbed a tree to get a better view. There must have been quite a, this must have been quite a sight to Jesus. And Jesus, seeing this short, stocky man, as I see him, <laughs> up a tree, trying to get a view, better view of him, says to Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house. I can almost hear Jesus saying this with a bit of a chuckle in his voice for seeing such a sight and for seeing an adult so adamant to get a look at him. The rest of the package, or passage goes, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. So Jesus shocks the crowd by going to Zacchaeus' house. Jesus establishes Zacchaeus' heritage by stating that he is a son of Abraham, and that he has been granted his salvation by faith. Also, Jesus' mission has been fulfilled in stating that the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Jesus does what the Jewish nation has failed to do, to become the shepherd to the lost sheep of Israel. And in the final parable of the ten minyas, a man of noble birth goes to a faraway land to be appointed king, and then to return. Christ dying in resurrection, Ten servants are each given a minya, about three months' wages, and are told to put the money to work. The subjects who hated him and didn't want him to be king were the Jewish leaders, and his servants represent those closely associated with Jesus. If there are true believers, the rejection of the third servant, who viewed the owner as a harsh or hard man, the servant's attitude suggests one contrary to trust and faith. Though this man serves the master, he is not really allied to him. One interpretation is Jesus is speaking to Judas. The parable goes on. The servant who earned ten more rewarded with more service. Uh, the servant who earned ten more was rewarded with more service, ten cities, additional responsibility. For it has been for he has been totally faithful. <coughs> the second service reaped five more and is rewarded with five cities. Where the third servant has done nothing with his money, does not think the king is worth laboring for because he would probably just rob him anyway. This servant ends up with nothing and is called wicked by Jesus. If the servant knew he was a hard man, he could have at least put it on deposit and reap some interest on it. Failure to use one's gifts will result in judgment. The final group to be dealt with was the, were the rejectors, the Jewish leaders who did not want Jesus to be named king. Their rejection is total. They will be slain. In the short term, it may refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, or in the long term, the judgment of a God they have rejected. Jesus then leaves for Jerusalem. Jesus has been established as the son of David, the shepherd of the lost sheep, and the king whom his subjects reject, and his servants serve both faithfully and poorly. The stage is now set. So on that Palm Sunday so many years ago, in which group would you find yourself? When the cheering subsides and turns to taunts and then to threats and calls for crucifixion. When the cheering supporters shouting Hosanna 
turned to the mob, shouting, crucify him, where would you be? I'd like to say I'd be among those who supported Jesus to the end, worshiping him at the cross, 